Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Patricia Engel is the author of The Veins of the Ocean, winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, It's Not Love, It's Just Paris, winner of an International Latino Book Award, and Vita, a finalist for the Penn, Hemingway, and Young Lions Fiction Awards, New York Times Notable Book, and winner of Columbia's National Book Award, the Premio Biblioteca de Narrativa Colombiana. And this book that we're talking about today is called Infinite Country. She is a recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Her stories appear in the Best American Short Stories, the Best American Mystery Stories, the O. Henry Prize Stories, and elsewhere. Born to Colombian parents, Patricia teaches creative writing at the University of Miami. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a fan of your show. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Infinite Country. Tell me about this book. Can you tell listeners what it's about? And then I'd love to hear what inspired you to write it. Infinite Country is the story of a Colombian family fractured by immigration and deportation over 20 or so years, beginning at the end of the 1990s. And it follows this family through the turn of the millennium and all the changing times, 9-11, the war on terror, just the war on terror and what that brought in terms of changes in the immigration system, and then the onset of the Trump presidency. And then this family, as they grow, it starts with just following just a young couple. They have a baby and then another child and another child. It follows what happens to them as they're split up by deportation and all the complications that immigration brings to a mixed immigration status family. Wow. And you're of Colombian descent yourself, correct? Yeah, my parents are both Colombian and I'm a dual citizen. Were you born here? I was born here. And they, were they, can I even ask about their journey to coming? Do they live in the United States? Obviously you were born here. Yeah, my parents live in the United States. They came to the United States at different times and they actually met in the United States and then got married in Colombia and then came back here to just start a new life with my brother and me. Wow. And do they, I'm not to keep talking about your parents, but in the book, there's the grandmother figure with the what do you call it, lavanderia, or who is firmly entrenched in her Colombian roots and doesn't want to leave and doesn't even want to leave her house. Do you have a relative who's still in Colombia or was this all your imagination? Well, so Infinite Country is largely set in Bogota, the capital of Colombia, which is also my mother's hometown. My mother left her entire family to come to the United States. However, my mother's parents died. Her mother died before I was born and her father died when I was a baby. So I never knew my mother's parents, really. My father's family, my father's from Medellin, another beautiful city. They, most of them, his immediate family came to the United States. So I knew my paternal grandmother and I was very close to her. She was a mother of nine children. Oh my my gosh. And she was also the first writer in my family. So it's really from her that I understood what it's like to be someone who feels the need to write, who has stories to tell. So she is similar in being this, you know, wonderfully huge maternal force to the grandmother character in Infinite Country. But she's also very different in that she left her homeland. She left her parents to come to the United States. And of course, Infinite Country follows two only children, Mauro and Elena, and how they come together to form their own family with their own children. And I come from a very, very huge (laughs) Colombian clan. (laughs) No, it's funny. I just interviewed a woman who has a book coming out at a similar time, if not the same day. Her name's Lauren Fox and her book is Send For Me. And it was about the Holocaust, but it was the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that a woman and her baby and her husband had to leave and leave behind their mother. And then she was back there. It's the same 
longing, but set in the Holocaust, but it's so the same. It's, it's almost like things are not necessarily changing. They're just picking up and moving in different reasons and different political climates. But that sense of having to leave your, the loss of leaving a loved one or leaving a family, it's, it's still just, it's just so ever present even today. Yeah. That's one of the things that infinite country explores, which is how it is a completely natural impulse to want to find a better life for your family, to provide a better future for your children. And it's really how the human race has survived for so long is by constantly moving and migrating and seeking more resources. And it's it's a natural instinct. However, politics and society and, and all sorts of prejudices have kind of trained people to look at it as something negative that this need for movement or this need for survival or just ensuring more security for your family is somehow something to look down upon, something to criticize. And it's really not like you just explained. Uh, diaspora is, the, you know, the world condition. Mm-hmm. That's how that's how the, the world as we know it came to be. I just left my little guy upstairs watching like he's doing homeschool and or remote school, I should say, watching videos of like jaguars in captivity or something like that. And it's like the same thing, right? It's the animal instinct as well. It's like all of human nature. They're moving. They don't want to be in prison. Like, I mean, not prison, (laughs) a zoo. They like, just like people. I mean, everybody, all creatures want to get up on higher ground, essentially. Yeah. And it's funny. We'll watch hours of documentaries about animals and the the magic of migration Mm -hmm. and how they just know where to go, you know, to find water or food. And and yet when humans have the same sort of need and impulse and drive, we think, oh, what are they doing? It's, you know, and it's and it's a totally different mindset. I wonder if the animals are also sad and missing where they came from because another very human and perhaps creature <laughs> pan creature phenomenon is is also the sense of a longing for home right so it's on the one hand you want to achieve and find better circumstances but you also people long to have like a home base and i don't know it's like dueling concerns i wonder if you know mr jaguar upstairs on the video is like longing for his mama jaguar somewhere. This is like a ridiculous conversation. I'm sorry, but it's it's just so prevalent, I guess. <laughs> I think there's definitely something to it. There's things that are just in our DNA, our connections to our our points of origin, our homelands, the landscapes that made our people, the our ancestors, the ones who came before us. So I think we do feel that sometimes, you know, a lot of people like to go back to to their ancestors' homelands and, and they feel, even if they've never been there, an immediate connection. And I don't think that's imagined. I think that's from someplace deep within us that we don't even know how to describe yet scientifically. And a lot of things are passed through the body from trauma. Scientists have come to study this through Holocaust survivors. Like you mentioned, there's a lot of studies done on how trauma has been passed from Holocaust survivors to their descendants. And the same thing, a connection to a homeland and a lost homeland that you've been forced to leave. I think that also exists somewhere within us. Absolutely. And I am someone who, I can't go to summer camp without feeling homesick. Do you know what I mean? Like... I'm away from my home for a weekend. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and so I found myself actually rooting for them to go back a few times, especially like when the second baby came and espe- the scene that you mentioned earlier, the 9-11 scene where she can't even get Mara's attention because I'm probably not pronouncing it right, because he's so busy stressing out about where are they actually going to live after having gotten booted out of all these different temporary situations. And she's sitting there wondering, you know, am I hallucinating? Like, is this actually and happening? Is it postpartum? Like, where are we going to go? And I'm like, maybe they should go back. You know, maybe they would be better off if they went home, but you know, they don't, they just forge on, forge ahead. That's a question that follows a lot of immigrants through their whole life. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have this idea that when you make the decision to leave one place and begin a life in another, that the decision is made and, you know, here you are and, you know, and life just moves forward. But it's really different in my experience, being the daughter of immigrants and all the immigrants in my community that I've grown up around. There's so much doubt involved. There's so much wondering if you made the right decision. There's so much wondering, wow, it's so tough here. Why don't we just go home where everybody knows us? 
and where, you know, people love us, where everything that we know is and everything is familiar and not strange and we speak the language. So it's full of wondering if you made the right decision because it's a huge decision. When people immigrate, they're essentially rupturing their family history and breaking ties for the future generations. And it can be very painful. And you often wonder if you made a mistake. And often there's this parallel life that continues in your the place that you left behind because that, that place is not going anywhere. It's still there. And in a way, it's always kind of calling you to come back. And there's you know, a place to go back to. Of course, it's often at the price of the life that you made in this new country. So that's it's very often the dilemma of people who have made that decision to move from one uh, country to another. Wow. Yeah. It would be interesting, actually, to have a book where, not that your book wasn't interesting, your book was very interesting, and obviously so thought-provoking that it's like raising all these other questions, but to to see a family and have like narrative <laughs> plot lines, right, where if they stayed this is what happens. And then if they left and immigrated, this is what happens and how their stories mm-hmm. sort of unfold differently. Like, I don't know, that'd be neat if, you know, <laughs> for yeah. your next book. <laughs> sort of like sliding doors. Yeah, sliding of, doors, uh, immigration version or something. Yeah. Well, tell me about your your writing. That's so interesting that your grandmother was a writer and that you feel that sort of in your DNA. Also, tell me about when you knew you were a writer and how you got started on this journey, not just with writing, but also to for publication? I think I was writing as soon as I learned how to write, to put letters together. I used to draw a lot. There's a, my family is just full of creative people. Like I said, this painting behind me is done by my uncle. There are a lot of painters and musicians in my family. So everybody had some kind of creative outlet and my family took everybody's creativity very seriously, but everyone had a day job. So I didn't know any professional writers. I just knew my grandmother who had nine children but she used to lock herself away to write. And that was just her thing. And everyone respected it and lived around it and acknowledged it. And she never showed her writing to people. I mean, sometimes she would she would write these like epic letters to people, even people who live nearby. And she would um, share poems and sometimes like little short things. But she wrote like volumes of things that nobody ever read. They were for her. So I understood that writing was like, first and foremost, something you do for yourself. Um, to keep yourself company, for pleasure, for joy. So that's how I wrote my whole life. I used to keep a lot of journals and just write things, but I wrote to entertain myself if I was lonely or just for fun and just to explore my imagination. And I didn't have any professional ambitions really tied to it because I didn't know that was a possibility. So when I went to college, I didn't even know you could major in creative writing. I remember I took a creative writing class it was like an elective. And I went to talk to the professor like during office hours. And I was like, oh, I'm really into writing. What can I do? And he looked at me and he was like, you? Like, you, you're into it? You know, like I wouldn't bother. What? But that was it. That was it. You know, I just, you know, sort of stepped away and oh. kept, went back to keeping my writing private for years. I had another professor, really a fantastic professor, Norman Finkelstein, who taught philosophy. And he would have us write these essays like every week, a personal response to whatever we were reading in the class. And he would start writing me notes like, you're a really good writer. You should keep doing this. You should keep doing this. And by the end of the semester, and he was a man of not easy compliments, let's say. (laughs) And he wrote me, which I still have. He said, you know, you're a writer. You need to keep doing this. It's going to be very hard, you know, but don't stop. That's all he wrote. And that just kept me going for years. And eventually I had other jobs. I lived in New York or for quite a long time. I had a variety of jobs in New York and I would just write for myself again, just like out of pleasure. I took some workshops at night and various continuing education programs in New York until I finally decided I used to go to the Barnes and Noble and Union Square to like the magazine section on the second floor. And that's where I discovered Poets and Writers Magazine, which is full of ads for MFA programs. I didn't even know what an MFA program was. And I just started learning about these possibilities. And finally, I applied for an MFA program that was three years. And that's what brought me here to Miami, where I live. And I thought, well, I have three years. I'm going to see what I can do with this writing thing. And yeah, and a year after I finished, I was teaching and I had an agent and I got a a two book deal. And 
it sort of began from there. Wow. That's wonderful. Well, congratulations. <laughs> that's a great story. I am impressed time and time again by the influence of teachers. Obviously we know this, mm -hmm. but particularly for writers, I feel like having an advocate early on makes or breaks it. And for this is the story of like complete discouragement, which I, if I find it heartbreaking. I mean, that one thing, you know, what would you have written if you had not been discouraged? Would you have written more than, I don't know. It's just terrible. So anyway, I don't know. I just feel like the power of a teacher to bring out the writer and everybody is, is really notable among other gifts that teachers give students. Absolutely. So what, are you working on another book now? Yeah, I have a story collection that will be coming out, I don't know, maybe next year or so. And then I'm working just in the very early stages of working on my next novel. Wow. And did your grandmother's writing, like whatever happened with all of it, didn't anyone ever find it? Like, can you read it or... Uh, one of my uh, relatives, I think, has most of it. So, but for a long time, I didn't really ask to even see it because I just thought it would be too painful. So, yeah, one of my relatives has it, but I don't know about anybody else. I haven't dipped into it really. I only have personal writings, letters that she wrote me and to some other people that they've since given me, things like that. Well, I think that's another project in the making <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to hear her whole like, what was she doing? Aren't you curious? I feel like I'd be so curious. My grandmother loved to write too, but she always dismissed it. She's like, oh, I'm more of a letter to the editor type of writer, you know? And I'm like, no, you're not. And she would always write letters to the editor, like all the time, which is like, I don't know, is that even a thing anymore? You know, like hardly any publications. Yeah, yeah I mean, all right. <laughs> but yeah, that's what she called herself. That's funny. Well, what advice would you have for aspiring authors? I do teach. You were talking about teachers. I teach creative writing at the University of Miami. So we we cover it all there. But, you know, a couple of tips that are not just for students, but for my friends who are trying to finish a writing project or when people ask me for advice. And I would say, don't be afraid of throwing away writing in order to get the, to the good stuff. Sometimes what I see is a lot of people are very attached to things that they've written that are simply not working, that simply need to go through more work because they're so attached to what they've already done they can't really free themselves to get to the next level of possibilities. Another tip would be to just stick with it. You know, finishing a draft or finishing anything or the writing life, it doesn't happen overnight. It's really just an accumulation of days spent alone writing. <laughs> you know, it's a bit thankless <laughs> on the day to day, but you don't really come to writing if you're looking for pats on the back at the end of each day. But if you can embrace that and settle into that, the rewards of just being able to live in your imagination are huge. And that's, that's the real joy for me. The joy is in the work. It's not in so much in what, what comes after. Of course, it's wonderful to be able to connect with people over something you've written. But really, on the day-to-day, -day, what keeps me going and returning to blank pages is that, that I love it. That's beautiful. Love it. And are there books, is there a genre that you like? Like, are you drawn to literary fiction yourself or what type of book do you like? What type of book genre, I should say? I do love fiction. Fiction is my first love, novels and short stories. I do also enjoy poetry, memoirs, sometimes uh, nonfiction books. Yeah. I, I try to push out of my hab habitual zones uh, as much as I can. I like to read a lot in translation and I'm kind of always looking for books that are not the obvious ones that everyone is recommending or everyone's talking about. So I'm always looking to expand my orbit of what I'm exposed to in writing. Because if you're, if you're not careful, the thing is that your reading universe can be very small, you know, and based on what just people are recommending to you or what's being talked about. And there's so many other amazing books written and published and not even just the United States, just around the world. And, and it's, it's a way to discover so much more about the world. But I can recommend, I can recommend them. If you find them here, that's a good recommendation. Don't, don't ignore yeah. those. <laughs> No, of course not. I'm just kidding. Amazing. Well, thank you. This was so great. Your novel is beautifully written and really thought provoking. And I feel like, you know, 
I, I just feel like I see your characters as they move all over, you know, with like these lines all over the country, right? As they move from Colombia mm-hmm. all the way, like a, a little map of of how they are just trying to make life better. And, you know, in the lines is is true inspiration. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you. Have a great day. <laughs> okay. Thanks. You too. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 